Aloha, and welcome to the special Vegan Society of Hawaii presentation for Earth Month. We have a wonderful guest today, Dr. John McDougall. Thank you. Aloha. 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 <laughs> Aloha, John. Yeah, all right. Good to be here. And real nice to have all the folks here that many I know and many I'd like to get to know. Uh, my name is John McDougall. I'm a medical doctor, a board certified internist. And Mary and I consider our home because it was the greatest, the greatest time of development for us as a family and also a profession. Our home is and always will be Hawaii. Even though this is the fourth, fourth place that we lived, is what I'm broadcasting from now is the fourth place that we've lived. We started out in Michigan, we moved to Hawaii, then to California, and now we're in the state of Oregon. There's only one place I'd really like to go back to, and that's Hawaii, of course, you understand that, and you understand why. Uh, just a, a brief uh, discussion that I think is really important for you to know about is Mary and I left Michigan because we wanted to get out of Michigan. And uh, we decided that the most wonderful place in the world to go would be Hawaii. And so we took that big step and we went there. I did my internship at the Queens Medical Center. Then I spent three years as a sugar plantation doctor. And believe it or not, people in Hawaii don't even know what a sugar plantation doctor is. I went back there and visited uh, a few years ago, and I, I mentioned that I was a sugar plantation doctor. They had no idea what I was talking about. I, mean, I was just talking about talking to two younger people, I guess. But I spent uh, three years taking care of 5,000 plantation patients who worked at Hamakua Sugar Mill up in Hamakua. And it was uh, a place that I learned pretty much everything I know about practicing medicine. So I owe a lot to my patients from that experience on the Big Island. I learned, uh, first of all, what a lousy doctor I was because my patients never got better when they suffered from chronic diseases. Well, they got better if I sewed up their wounds from a laceration or straightened out a broken bone or treated an infection, which are acute problems. But chronic problems like obesity and diabetes and heart disease and cancer and constipation, et cetera, they never got better. And I would pass out pills by the handful, and they just never got better. So I took the blame as a lousy doctor. The, the second thing I learned was the importance of a healthy diet. And I learned that on the Big Island, I don't know if I learned that anyplace else in the world. Uh, I was taking care of first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans. Primarily, they were my patients. And of course, you understand that first generation, they were raised in their native land of the Philippines or Japan or China. And, you know, when they moved to the Big Island to start a new life, they took their eating culture with them. And so they stuck with a starch-based diet, a diet based on rice with all, almost no dairy and, and very little meat and, you know, a few vegetables, but mostly rice. Now, their kids who were raised in Hawaii, they, uh, in fact, we were just a, a mile from Texas Drive in the home of the Malasada. The kids, they learned the Western diet and they learned it with enthusiasm and they become overweight and sick and grandkids, they were really overweight, really sick. And, and I have to say in Hawaii now, and, the, and we're talking about the state, are some of the uh, most overweight, most ill people in the United States. And it's because uh, the people of Hawaii have taken on the American diet with enthusiasm. Like for example, the Filipinos in the state of Hawaii have the highest rate of gout there was a time when the Chinese had their highest rate of cancer. You know, it just goes on and on and on. So anyway, uh, I left after three years on the sugar plantation, understanding I was a lousy doctor and that there were different ways to eat. And my healthy patients were those who lived on, on a simple diet of rice. And those who ate the basic four food groups, in other words, lots of meat, lots of dairy, lots of calcium, lots of protein, they were sick. And I went back into training at John Burns School of Medicine, where I spent a little over two and a half years in a medical residency program. I got a phenomenal education. I also I got an independent ed education at the Hawaii Medical Library, which was on the grounds of the Queens Medical Center at that time. I, I lived in the Hawaii Medical Library. And then I left after graduating. I left and started practicing Kailua. By 1986, I'd quit standard medicine. 
By 1986, I no longer carried a beeper. By 1986, I didn't take any office hours after five o'clock. By 1986, I didn't see any patients unless they were interested in seeing me for what I had to offer. I did a, a radio show, I believe it was called KGO. The radio show in Hawaii, I was on there for many years and Terry Shantani took over that show. And I had a lot of chance to meet a lot of people. Got some legislation done in Hawaii like the informed consent breast cancer bill. And you know, it was really a place of, uh, of development for me. And I'll, I'll always look at that as, as our home and the place that really gave me the education I needed to practice to be the doctor I am today. Anyway, we left Hawaii finally after 15 years. And uh, after, after, after almost 10 years of traveling across that big pond to do my work, which was television, radio, newspapers, all the way from San Francisco to New York City. And it was a long trip and got a job offer at uh, San Lita Hospital in the Napa Valley. And uh, I took it and I spent 16 years there running a program at San Lita Hospital based on diet therapy, which you're gonna hear a lot about diet therapy. In other words, I took people who were sick from the rich Western diet and I put them on a healthy diet and uh, they got better. And so I did that for 16 years and I finally left there in 2002. And I spent the next 18 years running a program from a resort, a resort, a very nice resort in Santa Rosa, California. We took care of uh, about 3000 people at each place uh, at St. Helena and at the resort. So I, I took care, I've taken care of about 6,000 people in a residential setting. When I say I've taken care of them, I was their doctor. I touched them, I talked to them. You know, what a great experience it was for me. And then in 2020, what happened is we had COVID-19 and that shut our program down. You know all about that. I don't have to go into details. And we started a telemedicine program, which we run today. And it is a better program than any program I've ever run in the past. Better than my office experience, far better. Better than my experience at St. Helena. Better than my program at the resort. We get better results. People like it better. We get to take folks from all over the world in our 12-day telemedicine program. We have doctor care. And people learn to cook in their own home. And we were able to cut the cost by about two-thirds. It's about a third of what it used to be when you used to come to our resort program. Well, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about the chronic diseases, but I decided what I really want to talk to you about is I want to talk to you about my new interest, which is diet therapy instead of for patients. Remember, I did diet therapy for patients, 12,000 of them actually. My new patient is planet Earth, diet therapy for planet Earth. I, I want to focus on that, and I, I figured I'd, I'd skip over a little bit the, um, the chronic disease part you know, that's taking care of people with uh, obesity and constipation and arthritis and high blood pressure and diabetes and gout and, you know, dietary diseases, uh, taking care of these people and getting phenomenal cures. There are three scientific papers published in our work so that shows clearly scientific cures. You can go to my website, you can read those scientific papers. So, uh, what I do is, uh, is, has been very rewarding. I often call myself the luckiest doctor in the world because my patients get better. They don't get just a handful of pills and a bunch of excuses. So that's the chronic disease part. If you stop doing the things that make people sick, which is primarily from the fork and spoon, then the natural healing capacity of people takes over and they get well. They get well and they get sick from a, an, a, a a wrong diet, a incorrect diet for human beings, a diet that's really been only popular for 50 to 100 years. That's the risk Western diet, and that's an abnormal diet. That's not normal. What's normal is the way that people have eaten for, I don't know, 750,000 years, a million years. I don't know how far do you want to go back, but we're going to talk about that. The other thing to be aware of is uh, I got interested in the climate, uh, the COVID-19 issues when that changed the world around. And a lot of people suffered terribly, economic suffering and disease suffering. It was, it was really tough on a lot of people, but, but for us, it turned out to be a real advantage because it caused us to start the uh, telemedicine program where we take care of people over the internet. 
But one of the things I learned early about the COVID-19 epidemic was, in fact, it was so early, the first virus didn't even come to the United States or Europe when this was discovered. It was discovered in China. And that was that uh, people who were sick with chronic diseases, you know, the diabetes, the heart disease, the kidney disease, the obesity, et cetera, they're the ones that end up having to go to the hospital, having to be on a mechanical ventilator and dying. And if you were healthy, in other words, you eat a proper diet and you didn't have these comorbid factors, you had an asymptomatic disease or a mild disease. In almost all cases, there are, of course, exceptions. So that's the COVID-19 part is that, you know, really the foundation to staying well for the viruses we have now and the viruses of the future is to be healthy. You know, because those viruses are going to be changing as they have, you've seen them change. The, the immunizations can't keep up. You know, we're not going to be able to invent vaccines with enough variety to, to ever solve the problem. So forget it. You need to get healthy. You need to get healthy the same way that you get healthy from the chronic diseases, the diabetes and heart disease and obesity and so on. It's the same diet. Diet is the common denominator. And what I wanted to focus on instead of discussing with you these, uh, these two topics, which you could get a lot more information on by going to my website, is I want to talk to you about my new passion. So let's see if I can get this, uh, this up for us to discuss. All right, so I just told you about how I spent the first half century of my, of my medical career taking care of 12,000 people. Well, as of the birth of my first grandchild, which was in 2004, my interests changed. And uh, now my passion, not my practice, because I, st I still practice at our 12-day telemedicine program. I still, of course, see patients and make a big input there. But my passion is what I want to share with you today. And that is to uh, taking on a new patient, applying the principles of diet therapy for a new patient. And that new patient is planet Earth. And this is a real opportunity for us, all of us. So please pay attention. Diet, uh, as I mentioned, is uh, the common denominator for infectious diseases and chronic diseases. But we're going to talk about climate change, and all of these things have a huge impact in every aspect of somebody's life. Their personal appearance, their religious faith, animal suffering, loss of habitat, human suffering, and of course, financial. You know, people are going bankrupt and suffering and starving all over the world because of what's happening. You know, chronic disease, infectious disease, and also changes that are occurring as a consequence of uh, warming of our planet. Now, there's not a place on earth that is spared from what's going on today. I know, I know we get distracted from wars, like what's going on in Ukraine. We get distracted from the, COVID, the newest COVID variant, we do. But always going on is the warming of the planet. Even though you may not be focusing your entire attention on it, the planet keeps warming. And you have droughts and floods and wildfires and hurricanes and rising sea levels. You know what I'm talking about. You haven't been spared in Hawaii. You know what I'm talking about. Well, it's time to address this and hopefully we can keep our focus of attention on what's really important because you know the climate does not negotiate. It doesn't really care whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or whether you're Hawaiian or Japanese or white or black, it doesn't really care. But we have a way of dealing with this, and I want to talk to you about this over the next few minutes. And by the way, just to put all this in orientation, I, I consider you know my uh, my coming out as a doctor was my experience that I had in Hawaii, and hopefully today will be my second coming out with you folks in Hawaii. And I'll, and I do really mean it. I, I I really think that today is the day that I launch a successful mission on helping us save the planet. I've been working on this again for 18 years, but today is the day that'll make a difference because everything's gonna change. You know, a crack will open that'll let the light in 
And thanks to you folks and the people that I'm most warm to, I, I get a chance to, to present this monumental presentation, which is the best presentation I've ever done on this subject, I hope. Uh, I learned about climate change, as many of you did in 2006, when Al Gore did his famous documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. Opened our eyes. But all, Gore, all Al Gore told us then, and all he tells us these days is about fossil fuels. He doesn't mention diet at all. As a matter of fact, uh, he doesn't mention animal agriculture at all. Well, that may be because Al Gore was a black Angus farmer at that time, and he was markedly overweight. You know, to my eyes, he obviously followed the rich Western diet. So he opened our eyes and uh, made a great, great contribution and tried again to open our eyes in his sequel of 2017. But again, didn't mention food at all. And uh, then we had, we had the uh, monumental uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, World Bank, United Nations report called Livestock's Long Shadow, which is a report that came out in 2006, over 400 pages long, very extensive, the conclusion of that report was that animal agriculture is responsible for 18% of the world's greenhouse gases. 18% shocked the world, especially when it could be compared it to all transportation, all cars, all airplanes, all trains, all ships, which emitted uh, less than 14% of the greenhouse gases. So that woke people up to the fact that food had a lot to do with our climate. I wrote uh, my first newsletter on diet and climate. The newsletter was titled, it was in 2006, it was titled An Inconvenient Truth. We are eating our planet to death. And choosing a plant food based diet is a moral issue. And as I mentioned, I've been fighting this, uh, this, this fight for 18 years, and I'm not about to give up. I hope you're not either. In 2003, we had uh, the World Bank's environmental advisor, Robert Goodlin. And I, I know at least one of you that's listening right now was there at this presentation. 2003, and Robert Goodlin, in his presentation, he told us that the Food and Agriculture Organization, Livestock's Long Shadow, they missed a whole bunch of things that should have been included. The global warming potential of methane, emissions from land use and land use change. They excluded uh, carbon dioxide emissions from livestock respirations. And it was a whole bunch of stuff they left out in the conclusion of the World Watch Organization, in other words, Robert Goodlin and his group, was that uh, animal agriculture causes more than 51% of our warming, of our greenhouse gases. The Eat Lancet Commission is the most respected commission on diet and climate change in the world today. They came out with a report, they, they come out with reports intermittently, but the report that shocked the world initially was in 2019. They told us we had 13 years before it was be too late. Robert Goodland told us we only had three more years and that was in 2003. 2019, they gave us, uh, they gave us 12 years. But they came to the conclusion, an important one, that what we need to do is we need to eat vegetables and grains and legumes and limit red meat. But all they said was limit red meat. You know, they gave a whole bunch of excuses for meat eaters. You know, they told them, you're okay, don't, don't feel bad, we don't want to hurt your feelings. They didn't tell people how to eat well. They didn't give them the, the instructions on what to do. Well, the science is uh, absolutely consistent. Now, that is the greatest contribution of global warming is from animals, even farmed fish. Uh, people focus on, bish, on beef, but you know we're talking about poultry and 
and uh, pigs and all kinds of animals that people eat. And the foods that contribute the least, in fact, they're foods that grow and suck up carbon dioxide are things like rice and potatoes. Just like my patients, uh, the way my patients get well is I remove the damage and allow their natural healing capacities to, to shine. You see, the, the reason that disease progresses, the reason people are sick is because the damage from the fork and spoon outpaces the ability of the body to heal. The body never stops trying to heal. It's just that, it, it's just that the damage is so great, it's so consistent. It's every day, three, four, five times a day when it comes to the diet. And, and once you relieve this damage, in other words, change them to a healthy diet, what happens is the healing capacity catches up and you notice the benefits. The heart disease goes away, the arthritis goes away, the balls start working. That's what happens. Well, the same thing happens with planet Earth. Planet Earth is always trying to heal. It's just we don't stop the damage. In fact, the damage gets worse every year. Even though there's more recognition of what we're doing with fossil fuels, it's not slowed down. It increases every year. But we can heal and the planet can heal. And I'll show you the evidence for it right now. So how spontaneous healing of the planet goes on. During the COVID-19 epidemic, things changed around the world. You know, people were housebound, factories shut down, airlines stopped flying, people stopped driving their cars, required less energy. And what we see is a change in the environment during this short period of time. In this study, it's of, of China. And what they found is the, there was an annual seasonal shift so that greening, came 8.4 days earlier than average. And there was a 17.45% increase in leaf coverage. That's what these, these, two, these two pictures show you, is they show you how the climate became more green and earlier for a longer period of time because of relief of damage that occurred during the COVID-19 epidemic. The planet heals. In Italy, we see the same thing. You know, people had to hunker down, they say. It's closed down their businesses. The roads were empty and silent. And there was a decline in greenhouse gases, plummeting in greenhouse gases, which are particularly seen in Northern Italy, where they have a high, a high amount of nitrous oxide, which is one of the most damaging of the gases. Overall, overall, the uh, global emissions plummeted 17% during the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, if you look at the chart on the left, you see uh, global warming emissions were increasing. And then we had the COVID-19 epidemic come about in the year 2020. And, and look at the dramatic reduction that occurred and the peak of emissions that decreased in countries was as high as 26%. But this was only for a short period of time. You can imagine what we could do over a long period of time if we all got on board and we did the most we could. Say if we even shut down the use of fossil fuels completely, wouldn't that be good? Unfortunately, scientists tell us today that's not enough. We can shut down the production of fossil fuels 100% and the planet will not be saved. We're too late. Maybe in 1970, when I first came to Hawaii, we could have done it. We could have saved the planet, but no longer. Too much damage is done. Too much CO2 is in the atmosphere. We're not gonna save the planet simply by shutting off fossil fuels. You've got to stop believing in things that will never come true. All right, the next question you have is, okay, okay, uh, you show me how the earth can heal. Will people change their diet? And I know a lot of you are sitting there thinking, well, 
all right, people aren't going to do it. You know, what you said is true, John, but it's not important because people won't do it. So are we humans capable of saving ourselves, huh? Well, let's take a look at some lessons from the past so we can get directions for the future. During World War I, let me orient you, this is 1914 to 1918. This is uh, more than 100 years ago. During World War I in the country of Denmark, they had to change their diet. Well, they didn't have to, but they decided to change their diet. And th the reason was because uh, England and Germany were in big battles. And they set up the British blockade, which was intended to shut off the Germans. Well, look at Denmark, it's in the North Sea. And any blockade that affected Germany would have dramatic effects on Denmark. Now, during this period of time, 1914 to 1918, 400,000 Germans died due to malnutrition. Why? Because they kept believing that you need protein and you need calcium and you have to eat a well-balanced diet. So they tried to, to emulate the diet that they'd learned in the past, which was not possible then. However, the people from Denmark, they did something different. It was under the direction of Mikhail Hinhidi. Mikhail Hinhidi was a nutritionist in the 1800s and early 1900s. And he had big connections with the Danish government. And what they decided to do was they decided to change the food that people ate in Denmark. So three main Danes changed their diet under Hinhidi's direction and government support. In Denmark, the pigs died of starvation, but the people received sufficient nutrition. Nobody was hungry. What they ended up doing is they ended up eating the soybeans and the potatoes and the grains that they were feeding to the pigs and cows. And he said if Central Europe had adopted a similar diet, I doubt that anyone would have starved. In that period of time, if you were a pig farmer, maybe you got to have pork once a month. If you were the richest person in Copenhagen, you got a piece of beef once a year. What happened to these Danes? Three million of them. Well, that was reported in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1920. And what they talked about were the results, and you can look this up, you can read it, it's open access, uh, it's, it's, on your, it's on your computer if you want to take the trouble to look at it. Well, what they report is the number of deaths for people, live, adults living in Denmark decreased by 34%. This is the lowest death rate that Denmark has experienced prior to World War I, and since, near, since World War I. And it was predominantly through chronic diseases, but they also saw a reduction in infections. For example, the Danes, they had the lowest incidence of Spanish flu deaths of all European countries. And there's been lots of comparisons between COVID and Spanish flus. So you know this is relevant. Remember what I told you, if you change the diet, we stop the damage, the planet will heal. Back then, when World War I, between 1914 and 1918, what did they have for, for tools of communication? They had the telegraph. That's what they had. They had word of mouth, but they, as, far as, as far as distance communication, they, they had the telegraph, that's it. In 1915, they had the first transcontinental telephone conversations, and they didn't have the first transatlantic conversation until 1927, and the first TV was, was brought to Denmark in 1951. What do we have today? You know, three million Danes can change their diet and save their lives and their country. What can we do? What is the potential? We have instant communication. We have cell phones. 84% of the world's population can communicate instantaneously through modern technology. 
We have the tools to save ourselves much more efficient than the tools to save the people in Denmark, 3 million of them. We got 7 billion people to save, but we got nearly that many cell phones. What a world we live in. It's an amazing world, isn't it? It's too bad it's up to be lost. We got to do something about it, I think so. So I put together a website and I encourage you to visit. It's called uh, mcdougallfoundation.org. Now we still maintain the regular website. This is our primary business. This is our for-profit business, which is drmcdougall.com. But this is a foundation supported by the McDougall Education Foundation. And this is where, as I say, my passion is going. And we'll still do research and education which is involved with uh, drmcdougall.com, but this is the most important thing going on today on the planet. I gave a presentation one time to 500 doctors and afterwards one doctor came up to me and said, hey, I'm here to take my boards in lifestyle medicine and to learn how to be a lifestyle medicine doctor. But he said to me, how am I gonna practice medicine on a dead planet? Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, Whatever you're doing, how are you going to do it on a dead planet? This is the most important thing going on today. And whether we have three years or 12 years or whether or not you think it's too late, we have to see, we still keep trying, don't we? So the website, mcdougallfoundation.org starts out with a dirty picture, but quickly changes to the way things should be. You know, blues and greens and life and, that's the way it should be. And that's what the website is, uh, is dedicated towards is optimism. You're not gonna find uh, anything on the website that talks about what terrible trouble we're in. You can find that every place else you look, newspapers, newscasts, wherever you look, you can find a pessimistic message. This does us no good at all. I wanna hear about how we can get ourselves out of trouble, don't you? Well, that's what this website is dedicated to, is how we can get ourselves out of trouble. I just told you. If you didn't know before, I just explained to you again. It's the food. And once you fix the food, you can fix the planet. And people are willing and able to do this. And we have the communication to do this. The website uh, talks about our mission dedicated to informing global citizens about the positive effects of diet therapy on chronic disease and on our planet. Diet therapy, this is all about diet therapy. And we have a foundation which we hope people will support in any way they can, including financially. The uh, foundation, the website, it, it presents many webinars. For example, I put together four days of presentations from the world experts on diet and climate change. This is all available to you right now for free at mcdougallfoundation.org. So you have these, uh, these 12 experts, 16 episodes from the, the leading people in the world. Also, I presented for you uh, four hours, one day of education on protein. Protein is the most evil of all nutrients. The idea that we need to have protein as the most important nutrient is what's, what's got you and your relatives is sick. That's why you're in trouble. And then I also spent four hours, one single day, giving you a lecture about potatoes. Potatoes have been the worldwide pillar of nutrition and it's the potato that's gonna save us. Oh, sure, there are other starches that could save us, but the potato is the most efficient of all starches. It'll grow at high altitudes and it'll grow at sea level, it'll grow in dry climates and wet climates and hot temperatures and cold temperatures. The potato. So you'll want to learn about these things. You'll want to go to the presentations that I put on. Was there a total of uh, 24 hours, a whole day? if you don't go to sleep. These are the experts that I've had uh, talk at this particular presentation, the 12 experts. 
and of course the protein in potato lectures. And then I talk about uh, something really important. Front page, this is just front page. It's called the four dietary, four deadly dietary deceptions, four deadly dietary deceptions. This is the reason we're in trouble is because of misinformation out there. Let's go through these diet, deadly dietary deceptions. Uh, the first one is protein. When I mention protein, what do you echo? Meat? Okay, but you need to understand, if you haven't heard it before, it is absolutely true. There's no dissension. There's never been a case of dietary protein deficiency ever reported in humans on any natural diet. It does not occur. But believing in protein causes people to be sick because those are the foods that they seek out. The dairy, the poultry, the fish, the meat. And these are, these are, the, are the animals that are destroying the planet. Not, not just by growing and transporting the animals, but by the deforestation that takes place. We have three times the quantity of meat as we did 50 years ago. Dietary deception, calcium. I mentioned calcium, what do you say? You say milk. Well, calcium deficiency has never been, never has occurred on any natural human diet. It doesn't exist. And you know this already because you've seen that billions of people have grown to normal adult skeletons without a speck of dairy in their diet. And, you know, raising these cows to make dairy foods produces the same greenhouse gases, the methane, the nitrous oxide, the CO2. But the thing about a dairy cow is a dairy cow lives about six years. I mean, their lifespan is 28 years, but they usually pass them off to the meat industry after about six years. Whereas a, uh, a beef cow, they slaughter them between 14 and 18 months of age. So the dairy cow is around a lot longer. And as a result, they produce as much damage to the environment as beef cows do. We've doubled the amount of dairy in the last 50 years. Deadly dietary deception number three is omega-3 fats. I mentioned omega-3 fats. What do you say? When I say you, don't take any personal offense. I know you, most of you are well-educated, but what do your friends and relatives say? I mentioned omega-3 fats. The answer is fish. No fish has ever made an omega-3 fat. They can't do it. Neither can any other animal. Any animal, fish, mammal, bird, Worm, there's no animal that can produce omega-3 fats. There's no animal that can desaturate the carbon chain at the number three and number six position. It, they can't do it. And so how do the fish get the omega-3 and the reputation to be full of good fats? Well, they eat seaweed and algae that make these fats. And the damage to the planet Earth is huge. Since I was a young boy, 90% of the fish had been taken from the oceans. You know, a lot of people understand that uh, beef and pork and even poultry is not so good for them. And they've decided to get their protein from fish. Well, my message to them is you better eat up quickly because only 10% of the fish are left and pretty soon they'll be gone. And when they're gone, the oceans are gone. When the oceans are gone, we're gone. Global fish consumption has increased, has doubled in the last 50 years. Okay, dietary deception number four, it's kind of the opposite in the sense that when I talk about unhealthy fattening foods, you, your relatives say starch, starch. That's, a, that's one of the more serious deceptions. If you look around the world, what you find that the people who consume the starchiest foods are the trimmest, fittest, and healthiest people. 90% of the, of the, well, more than that, eating patterns reveal that 90% of the bowls and plates have been filled with corn and potatoes and wheat. I think I could say it another way. It's 99.99% of the people who walk this earth have lived on starch-based diets. And if you believe starch is bad for you, where are you going to get your calories from? You're going to get it from animal foods, aren't you?
the foundation, uh, this is the foundation page. This is the webinar page. We've already have four, four uh, different webinars out since we started the website. One is by Dan Butner, who wrote the Blue Zones. And the focus of these webinars is the climate. Dean Orange, he uh, volunteered a little more than an hour of his time to talk about the climate. Michael Clapper. A guy named Mercer who wrote the book, Climate or Food is Climate. We did an interview with him. And I'll be getting more and more interviews up that give you a positive point of view. We'll tell you about things you can do to make this a better place to save the planet. On the website, we provide a planet saving diet. It's a, the diet that Mary and I have written over the past 46 years and brought to you in the form of 13 national best-selling books and many newsletters, uh, adventure trips, seminars, and, and live-in programs. And we dedicated this diet to the uh, mcdougallfoundation.org website. So people can come to the website and without any cost to them, without much effort at all, they can learn everything they want, need to know about the McDougall diet, including recipes and meal plans and so on. Now, the food that I'm recommending that people eat to save the planet is a, a food that I recommended for people for 46 years to cause them to regain their health. This is starch, rice, corn, potatoes, pastas, breads, beans. 90% of the food should be based on starches. Now, you don't have to bring out a scale. You don't have to consult a dietitian. You just look at your plate. And 90% of what you see should be starch. And then the last 10% would be things like uh, green and yellow vegetables, the various kinds of fruits. That's the meal plan that we talk about on the website. And we offer lots of recipes. We have over 4,000 recipes available, no cost. They're available on the website, in the books, I guess it's a small cost for the books. We also have a McDougall cookbook app, which is five dollars, has five has a thousand recipes in it. So plenty of recipes to get you started and continue along the course to eat a good diet to save yourself and the planet. Diet therapy for planet Earth. I present one one page in there that talks about what can accomplish. It kind of summarizes what we've talked about so far. And that is that the FAO says that the animal agriculture provides 18% of the greenhouse gases. And I told you that the World Watch Institute changed this figure to a more realistic one, and that is that animal agriculture provides 51% of the greenhouse ga gases. And the most encouraging of all the reports say that animal agriculture if we correct it, we eat a healthy diet, which happens to be, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. If we eat a healthy diet, we can reduce our contribution of greenhouse gases by as much as 87%. The food we eat directly affects the planet. I spent a little bit of time explaining to people what happens in terms of animal agriculture. And you've heard all this before, so I won't go over it with you again. And then I do say something that's really important, that is progress has been painfully slow and largely off target. You know, they've either not hinted at all or they've hinted a, a little bit without any real direction on how to fix the problems. Like, for example, we talked about uh, livestock's long shadow. They told you that it was animal agriculture, but they didn't tell you what to eat or how to do it. Al Gore didn't even tell you about the diet about the animal contribution. Neither did, uh, neither did Goodland from the World Watch Institute. And I, I think the, the, the biggest travesty, travesty is brought up by some of our strongest advocates for saving the planet like Bill Gates. Bill Gates uh, went around over the past year selling his new book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. And in his presentations, he said, we should consider everything and anything to save the planet. And he did his interviews from two burger restaurants in Seattle eating hamburgers and cheeseburgers.
The future is ours to change. The future is ours to change. And what we need to change to is a traditional eating plan. Now I've tried to make this as comfortable as possible for people. And so I've, instead of calling this a vegan diet, you know how people react to the word vegan. Uh, you can imagine how they'd react if I called it the McDougal diet. But in truth, both terms apply. Uh, what I've done is I've called it a traditional diet, which I, th I think should cause people to, to want to do this, to have pride in their ethnic origin. And what we need to do is we need to take one year turn in our diet, one year turn to save ourselves. And I'll start out by discussing a coin that was put out about 12 years ago. It's a dollar coin put up by the US government and uh, it depicts the three sisters, which are corn, beans, and squash. That was the diet of Native Americans, you know, real Americans. They lived on corn, beans, and squash. We could date potato eating for Native Americans in the Southwest back 12,000 years. Around the world, if you take a look at various populations in past history, what you find is all large successful populations of people have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. I know starch is another one of those offensive words, but I believe that needs to be taught to people because it's the correct word. We'll talk about the extremes of these populations over the next few slides. Like uh, corn. Corn has been a traditional diet of people in Mexico and Central America. The Aztecs and Mayans were known as the people of the corn for 7,000 years. They survived on corn. They fought battles. They participated in athletic events. They had children. They did business with a diet that was almost all corn. Few vegetables. Occasionally, they they tracked down an animal and killed it. Rice for more than ten thousand years. Civilizations in Asia have lived on rice predominantly. They picked other starches also. The breadbasket of the world used to be Egypt, Iraq, Iran, and now they describe Ukraine as the breadbasket of the world. I guess it's pretty close, isn't it? Well, these are populations that lived on barley and wheat. In fact, that was the bulk of their diet up until modern times. You go to South America. For 13,000 years, the people in the Andes have lived on potatoes. There are 400 different species of potatoes in the Andes. They have a, a freeze-dried potato in the Andes. They could do that in the Andy Mountains because at night, it gets very cold and the potatoes freeze. In the daytime, the sunshine heats them up to the point where they dry out. So they make something called chuño, which they store away in cool, dry places and it lasts for 10 years. Freeze-dried potatoes. And then we talk about our home. What was the diet of the traditional, the traditional Hawaiian people before the, before the missionaries came and brought the pigs? What was the diet? You know what it is. You learned it in school. You learn it because you're, you have pride in your Hawaiian heritage. You know this. Tao and poi, and sweet potatoes and yams and breadfruit and greens and fruits. And yeah, they ate a little bit of fish, but not much. The cooking, cooking methods were primarily steaming. They ate a few raw things, but you know, you can't eat taro raw and it's poisonous because of the calcium oxalate. So you have to cook it. This is a cooked food diet. And look at the calorie distribution. Low fat, high carbohydrate. It's a starch-based diet. Those of you who are interested in your religious heritage, you'll find every religious document that I've explored teaches the same lesson, as does the Bible. The Bible is has one of the, in fact, has, as far as I know, the first controlled tri scientific trial on, on diet. In this case, it's a planet-saving diet. There's a story in Daniel, story written 2,600 years ago, where Daniel and his men arrived at a, a new kingdom for a festival. 
And uh, at the festival, the kingdom served uh, a lot of meat, meat dishes. And Daniel said, well, I don't want to do this. I want to, I and my men, we want to stay on a diet of pulses and water. And so they agreed on an experiment where Daniel's men lived on pulses, which are vegetables, which they're starches and water for 10 days. And they compared their health to those who ate the royal foods. And they were declared healthier and better nourished and better complexions and every description you can think of based upon the version of the Bible. We've known this for thousands of years. Rich foods make people sick and they're killing our planet. So now I bet you're intrigued by the research that supports the statement I made that you can save the planet, you as an individual. And consider the effect of 7 billion people if we change their, our diets. We can, we all got cell phones. Can we really make a difference? I know you, you, uh, you recycle, you, you drive a hybrid car or an electric vehicle. I know that. What else can you do? What can you do to make a huge impact on the climate? Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the scientific research. And I'm going to show you the articles. And these are all the articles that I can find. I haven't left anything out. And there's connections there to the link so you can read the original scientific papers. And it's all on the website, mcdougallfoundation.org. First of all, I want you to understand that it's too late to solve the problems based upon eliminating fossil fuels. Read the title, Global Food Emissions Could Preclude Achieving the 1.5 to 2% Climate Change Targets. You know, those are the targets. If we pass those, we're done. And because of the foods that we eat on this planet, we're never going to get there. All right, let's take a look at what we can do if we change our diet. Going from meat to vegetarian, there's nearly a 50% drop in greenhouse gas emissions. Click on the blue letters. You can go read the original study. Free, open access for you to read. Ending animal agriculture would stabilize greenhouse gases and offset 68% of the CO2 emissions. Greenhouse gas reduction is achievable between a range of 62 and 78%. This review shows more than a 70% greenhouse gas emission reduction simply through changing our diet to a traditional diet. They call it a vegan diet. And oh, by the way, they worry about getting necessary nutrients like protein and calcium and so on because they don't understand the science. They shouldn't consider this at all because you cannot design a protein or calcium deficient diet. It's just not possible. I know this. I've written scientific papers on this, unchallenged. Plant-based diets could reduce emissions by up to 80%, says the Eat Lances Commission. I talked to you about the Eat Lances Commission. I told you they were the, the authority on diet and climate change all over the world. In this particular study, that going to a vegan diet resulted in an 81% reduction in greenhouse gases overnight, overnight. Let me say it one more time, overnight. This particular study, 83% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions overnight by simply changing from the Western diet to a traditional diet, a vegan diet, the McDougal diet, the Hawaiian diet, whatever you want to call a diet, as long as it's a starch-based diet and limits drastically the animal foods, it's, stop, it's time to stop eating the animals. Next study, greenhouse gas emissions reduction up to 84%. In the last study, the one I pointed out for you a couple of slides ago was an 87% reduction in greenhouse gases. You know, these studies show that we can save our home. And unless we pay attention to this and take some action, I don't even want to, I don't even want to continue with the adjectives, but you can fill them in. 
There are three documentaries I ask people to watch, and only three. I mean, there are a hundred different documentaries that talk about the effect of diet on climate. But these are the three. There's sea spiracy, cow spiracy, and eating our way to extinction. That's all. You get it all. You get all the information. You get all the stimulation you need from these three documentaries. That's enough. This is a book section. Food, food is uh, climate. It's a great one. In fact, I was going to write this book before Glenn Mercer wrote it. He did a great job. Esselstyn, Campbell, Nornish, Buettner. They've all contributed their books to this website to help people make the dietary changes that are necessary. Big changes beget big results. Uh, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop the fight, and neither has Earth given up. We got to put the Earth on a path to healing, and you know how to do that. We got one last card to play. It's a powerful card. It'll make the difference. I wouldn't talk to you about this. I wouldn't dedicate the final years of my life to trying to share this message if I didn't think this was a possibility. You know, since 2000, 2004, I've been ending my lectures to the public by saying, I don't ever want to have my grandchildren say, Grandpa, why didn't you try harder? Do you want your grandchildren to say that? I don't think so. Those who know have an obligation to act. You know. So this is our new project. And as long as I'm on planet Earth, this is where my dedication, my interest will be, is giving our, giving our species a, a future and all other species too. I believe we can do it. But I need your help. I'm in the process of building an army starting a revolution. There's nothing, as Bill Gates says, nothing that shouldn't be considered to save the planet. Hey guys, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. A lot of fun. I hope you share this, this uh, lecture with as many people as possible. And we'll be over to Hawaii as soon as we can. And as long as there's not a 90% kill rate with the new virus, we'll appear public, in public. Maybe behind a glass screen, but we'll, we'll appear in public. We'll be there. We love you. We love the both of you, too. Aloha and a big mahalo. Aloha, John. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it, was, it, was a, it was a nice reunion. We enjoyed the company. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye